seven of uh, the Tuesday night marathon here in the uh, famous Mechanics Institute Chess Club. And uh, today we join the 21st century after 160 years here. Well, we love tradition in this club, oldest chess club in the country, the beautiful tables and chairs. And there. I'm going to miss some of the uh, old demonstration boards where you do things by hand. But we're going to try this, and it's faster. Hopefully, the display is good, but we'll really appreciate your feedback afterwards. Elliot, if you'd like to change the pieces to make them uh, more attractive next week, that'll be fine. So this week we will discuss, of course, the ongoing World Cup, which uh, is now completing the third round there. And uh, a lot of people have been eliminated, actually. Uh, they're now into the fourth round. They're doing the tie breaks of the third round. A lot of the... Um, <laughs> yes, started with 128, 64 after the first round, 32 after that, and it will be down to 16 tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but our own Sam Shanklin, you know, he was uh, the favorite in the first round, but okay, he got knocked out by Safarli, who's an excellent player, but not quite as good as Sam. Okay, I'm not quite familiar with that position. Sorry. Uh, may, maybe we can go back. I've got things set up, and there's probably going to be a, a couple of bugs. Um, but when I get this a little more uh, worked out, then we can probably go back to any game that you like to choose. Uh, here I've just set them up in a particular database. Um, it, it, the notation is so small, we can't even see it anyway. So well, we're, we're actually going to move the pieces on the board. <laughs> just, just like the uh, old-fashioned one. And a, a surprise, or somewhat of a surprise, was Hikaru Nakamura getting knocked out in the second round. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, Nisipianu from Romania. And it's somewhat of a surprise, but Hikaru's just uh, seems to have lost some interest in chess over the last few years. You know, he's, he's only 32 years old, but he seems to have been playing professionally for 20 years already. And his ratings kind of going down to about 27, 30. Is, 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 um, poker or something else? I'm not sure. Yeah, I know he is a very keen poker player. He's a little serious. Is he married? Ah, uh, yes, and he, well, he was married a few years ago. Uh, not that I know of. Well, Anish Giri has one child, and his results uh, diminished a little after that, but Giri is back. Giri uh, played a very long tiebreak in the second round. They played eight games, and then it went to an Armageddon game in the uh, ninth round, and Giri prevailed in that. We're going to start out, though, with Hikaru's loss because actually it was very well played by his opponent. Um, there, Nisipiano had the uh, white pieces, and it's just a you know, typical queen pawn game, Catalan to begin with. Um, but Tecaro does a little bit of a strange maneuver, the queen over to a6, and with this move, knight to b5, uh, Nesipiani was trying to cause trouble, uh, that pawn on c7. So, okay, if queen to a5, you'd have the bishop to d2 would be attacking the queen. It's, it's a little bit of worry for black here. Uh, but Hikaru, as his style, he tries to get out in a very aggressive way, takes the knight on e5. Now that pawn on c7 is, is hanging the, the fork there in case the... Uh, Knight on f6 move, but Hikaru had planned rook to d8, hit, hitting the queen. 
and what makes the game exciting. Nisipiano, he's really quite a courageous player and principled, and he just sacrifices his queen, which Hikaru takes. And actually, this looks really good for the um, white side because you've already got a knight and a rook. The pawn's threatening the bishop on d6, and the knight is threatening to do a fork on the c7 square. But of course, Hikaru had a plan. It was bishop to d6, saving his bishop, saving the fork, and, well, your first sight, you say, hey, that's good, you know? Now black is up material. And Hikaru's always aggressive, you know, he, he plays for the win. The, the problem, of course, is black hasn't developed these queenside pieces. And there is this back rank checkmate you have to worry about. So that lends itself to, you know, pile on the pressure. And Nisipiano hits him with bishop to f4. Uh, and now there are problems with uh, the black position. You have to solve a lot of things. Uh, you can't just um, take the pawn on f6 because, um, well, you're going to get a fork on the uh, c7 square. So, um, um, th there's one way he could try to get out of that, uh, according to the computer. You first sort of hit them with a c3 move, just um, so that when the pawn takes, there's going to be no bishop to d2 after this funny move, queen to um, a5. Well, it's um, maybe, maybe black can hold equality this way. It's a very... It, sorry, you won't be threatening mate on d8 because there's a queen on a5. The queen on a5 sort of x-raying that d8 square. And I think Kikaro also didn't get this plan. Um, I mean, he, co he comes up with something that looks reasonable. He, um, he plays pawn to e5 um, to um, at least that way the bishop can develop on c8. And maybe Nisipano should have taken with the bishop, but he comes up with this plan because Karo can't take on e5, rook d8, mate. And your first glance, you say, well, okay, it's still, if as long as black gets developed, the material's roughly even. Um, thing is, white is very well developed. And Karo now finds the queen a5 move, but uh, this piano takes, of course you can't take the bishop on e5 because of back rank mate, and developing the piece. Again, at first glance you say, okay, I'm, you know, what, what are the pawns? Two, four, six, seven against six. Uh, just one pawn up for white. Um, well, if, if, the queen, if the queen moves away, as soon as the rook takes the pawn on d6, you're going to move the bishop out anyway. So, to stop the back rank mate. So maybe queen b4 or something. Uh, it, it's possible, but uh, maybe no better than this. And it, it takes quite an eye to see that black still has uh, big problems here. And you play, of course, the Morphe-like move, well, first save the bishop, but um, simply develop a rook. And um, this position, you can see the power of white's pieces. The, uh, you know, the bishops on these beautiful long diagonals, the um, of course, the back rank checkmate and this pawn on f6 is a real problem. Uh, you don't really want to take it because uh, you know, bishop takes f6 just makes the back rank mates worse. 
Um, if you take the pawn on e2, looks very nice, but uh, you can push that queen around. What is that? Yes, that's uh, now the the queen's going to have to back up. That's a black plate. Well, you you are thinking. Do, uh, you mean? Do, do you mean this pawn on uh, G seven to G six? Pawn to h6. You know, um, I think I might try that. He doesn't like that uh, he gets a very protected passed pawn, or, yeah, protected by the bishop. Yeah, and then you're threatening rook takes h6. That, that at least gives your king some luft. Yeah, not, not too much. So uh, Hikaru tried pawn to g6, just so you couldn't take the, uh, the pawn there. If he can get his pawn to h5, he'd have some space for the king. Um, uh, yeah, he's... It's, yeah, you're... Well, he's, he's definitely worse. Um, but White has to play well here. And anybody, suggestion for anybody? There's probably a few. That's very good. And I, and I trust you weren't looking at the... Um, at the <laughs> okay, good. I'm, okay, I'm going to... From now on, I'm going to leave these in small notations so <laughs> people can't cheat. You know? <laughs> and I can uh, applaud you for that move. So, of course, uh, black cannot take the bishop on uh, b7 because of the, the back rank. I mean, that's, that's easy. And meanwhile, the rook is hanging, so you have to do something with the, uh, the rook, which Hikaru does. And um, now this next move I like quite a lot. He just retreats to save his pawn on e2. And... It's hard to give good advice in this position, but um, maybe pawn to h5. Hikaru takes the bishop, which you think, well, maybe that's not so bad. He's got all these doubled pawns here. Pawns, yeah, triple pawns. Pawns are even over here. Queen versus a, a rook and bishop. Can it be so bad? Well, this is this is. Which, and Mike, that may have been a good move f3. But when you look at this position, your first glance is, oh, black is maybe okay. Yes. And this also shows you when a queen is good and when a queen is not good. Why this this uh, queen? is not good is there's absolutely nothing for it to attack. You know, we're going to secure this a4 pawn, the f6, the b2 pawn, the king will come up to guard f3. And so the queen, you know, it's just hitting on granite. It, it needs somebody, help from somebody else, and there's no one else because this rook has to. Yes. Yes, this position you have fun because they can't do anything to you. And that's, um, uh, well, he, um, there's also the rook coming to d7 at some point. 
But see, this, this uh, white king is totally safe. And... Uh, Yes, if you would get that A pawn, you would, um, yeah, if you win the F pawn, that's the end of the world. But. So he just takes one square at a time, as slow as can be, and you know, the rooks dominate. The queen's, you know, the powerful queen is there having to guard the A pawn, rook C8, and uh, I think someone mentioned this plan before, this if this bishop comes to b6, then you're just going to have too much power on the rook d8. Uh, sort of. He chucks a pawn. Rook. When he was younger, he used to do that. But it's no fun to play for check till checkmate in this position. Note the, the queen's got no squares outside the back rank, so rook d8's just going to win the queen for the rook. Here he did resign. Nick, was this the first or second of the two games? This was the first of the two games. And the second of the two games, um, uh, Nesipiano again played very well with the black pieces and got oh, probably a winning edge, but they agreed to draw just because then he advanced. So, a little sad, we lost uh, our own Sam, and we lost Nakamura, but um, we have Wesley So, Jeffrey Zhang, and uh, Lanier Dominguez as Americans still in, in the uh, World Cup. And, and Carolina's not in it because he's already got a spot? He has already qualified, yes. Yes, Mike? Isn't Sam Sevian playing as well? Oh, Sam Sevian got knocked out, yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's so easy to get knocked out. Karyakin got knocked out this round. He was, he was the challenger the previous, ta previous world championship match, and here he gets knocked out in the third round. Um, Mat Matalev, or I think it was a Russian player. Well, you have all good players. There's, you started with 128 good players, but when you got to 64, there were no easy games. Did somebody get to check Kramnik in this one? Kramnik retired. He was afraid of being checked. <laughs> Paul refers to uh, the last World Cup where uh, Kramnik played someone from Nigeria, I think it was, and he was... He checked Kramnik once in two games. But he... Well, it was some success. How many people get to check Kramnik yeah. after all? Um, um, okay, now what? Something. Uh, okay, my screen. I had a way to get it up, but I mean. Is it just me or does Jeff Bates have the most video skills of any? Huh. The most what? Could you do what? Interface? Interface. It's that from it, 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 it seems a little confusing. That's because across the top of the Microsoft set is inside. Oh, we'll just paste that in there and use Microsoft uh, what do they call it? Some stupid name. Um, how do I get that? That's, oh, oh, there I am. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I now choose. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we can maybe move a little quicker. Um, Grishuk is doing very well. He's always done well in these World Cups. Um, I think he's number nine or ten in the world, but he's, he somehow can advance in these 128 player fields, and the top two players get into the candidates tournament. So if we're down to 16 after this round, well, they've got to win three more matches to qualify. Um, Grishuk uh, against uh, Zhu Zhangzhu. He, um, 
had a Nimzo Indian as black and Jew at the white side. Um, kind of typical queen pawn game. This is all theory thus far. And knight to e4. Um, but Zhu tries a novelty which is a little aggressive to take that knight. And um, Grishuk had a nice counter to this. He's letting you take that pawn on e4, which Zhu does, but the black pieces become very active. And this was Grishuk's opening preparation before the game. So um, Zhu retreated with the knight and um, lost the g-pawn. So white has this uh, g-file, black has the two bishops, which white's not castling. But he did have knight to f5, opening the g-file, attacking the queen and the uh, g7 square. Very good. And you're like Grishuk, he just wasn't afraid. You know, okay, some people don't like those white pieces coming down, taking your pawns, check so close up and personal to the king. I mean, that Nigerian would have been very happy to do this to Kramnik. But. White doesn't have a black square bishop, so that would make me a little bit more calm about it. Yes, at least. You control some of these squares with your bishops. He's opening up the file for black troops, not the other way around. Yes. Good. It's um but Zhu is a very good player, so he just advances. Now when that other knight comes in there, that's gonna be an attack. The rook two knights, the queen, you know, waiting down there on C two. So you have to be really careful. But Grishuk is, you get a defender over there. And someone might. Do you some cleverness with uh, bishop e5 to open up the g file? Um, yeah, I, maybe you could just take that. I'm not sure. I th but then you swing a rook to the g file. Right after you made that back. King g1 check, king, king h2 to d2, and then rook to d8 check. Maybe you can hide on c3 and. But I think you'll like Grishuk's move. He, he gets that bishop back to be a defender. And uh, Zhu threatens checkmate on h7. So he defended that. And now castles long. <laughs> well, this is very good. And Grishuk actually goes kind of wrong here. He should just, um, I have my written notes the old-fashioned way. Um, yes, if he, if he just would go queen to h3, he would put the question to this knight on, on f5. Um, he did it a different way of, um, he just, he's up a rook, so he doesn't mind giving up some material if he can just defend. And, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Not not yet up a rook. But uh, yes, it, at this point, because if you take the bishop on e7, the king just takes the rook on g7 with extra material and a very safe position. But um, Ju had a chance to uh, sacrifice. and um, just activate his pieces. And this variation would be very unclear, in fact, even good for the white side with the rook to h1 coming. So um, it was a bit of an error by Grishuk to go bishop to e7. He, um, yes, if he had done instead queen to h3, and then this same thing happens. Um, you're able to uh, activate all your pieces and drive the queen away from such a powerful square. Um, something like 
even queen back. Yes, it's like, oh, well, there's, um, takes, takes, takes. Um, yeah, rook g8, knight g3. Um, bishop, bishop takes g3, yes, and black would, would work for black. But uh, you... Um, hard to play perfectly, and he been, went bishop e7. And now um, that taking on h7 would be good, but uh, Zhu played queen to c6, and the bishops were able to get rid of the knights. Looks very dangerous again for mates, but Grisha comes back, and Jew is able to win the queen, but this is just too much material for um, black. It does get to a very nice uh, position a little later on. See if you can reel in the point. So um, here are those pawns in the center, very dangerous. You know, the queen attacking the rook on d8. But how to advance to the next round? Anyone see a way to get out of your difficulties? Uh, bishop takes c7, rook takes c7. Oh, rook c7. What, what's that? Okay, bishop takes c, bishop to c7, queen b3, or wizard, rook takes no, no, queen c6. No, no, there's, there's queen of 6 for Jew. Ah, I don't understand that uh, bishop takes c and then, can I take your rook on d8? Yeah, uh, there's no stone. There will be. Bishop has to take the bishop. Okay, very good. In fact, he did that bishop to, takes e5, and the problem with queen d8, which looks winning, yeah, the discovered check. And the king can't hide from the rook check to win the queen. Yes, very good. Very good. Yeah, that was that was quite a move. Everything's hanging. Everything's hanging, and you take. You have to calculate a lot. But uh, that he did calculate, and Jew didn't even take the bishop. He preferred to go the queen against the uh, two rooks. But he's just down material, down two pawns, and gave up. So Grisha advanced. Um, and I think now it's, it's um, time to move on to some of the action from last uh, week's Tuesday night marathon. Oh, uh, one end game lesson before we move on to the marathon. This was something from the U.S. chess school. Sometimes you've seen once a year, Greg Shahadi brings these talented juniors to uh, our club here and sometimes to other sites, such as Atlanta, New York. And um, so he, um, he gives some positions. And this was a, a game, Nimzovich Tarash from San Sebastian uh, to, sorry, 1911. And Nimzovich goes a little wrong, gets in a bit of trouble. But they get to... Um, this position, where you have a rook and two pawns against a rook and two pawns. And back, threatening checkmate. So uh, Nimzovich makes a little error. And uh, how can you win this for the black side?
Okay, so that you get a pawn ending, you mean. Okay, so I will bring my king back. Am I going to be able to get your pawn over there? It's king and two against king and two. Push the pawn, and I run. I'm in the box. Ah. F5 check. And say I just run over to get your pawn there. Okay, thank you, yes. If you if you would go king to g6 to go G3, grab the pawn, g3, and you run in, but the old, whenever you take my pawn, I run, and it would be a draw. But as, as you um, said, if you first play the pawn to f4, yes. Suddenly, the white king can't run back to the f pawn because the eight pawn queens, and now you can calmly go and scoop those pawns up. And okay, so that was your end game puzzle. It's um, some sometimes I may even give you one of Tony's puzzles in the oh but th those ones take quite some time, and I'm not sure they're too good is warm up before your, your games here. So speaking of end games, we move on to the Tuesday night marathon and we will take the um, first board game, but just get through to... Um... Now, Josiah Stearman, who's in the lead and uh, really up and coming, doing a great job, playing once again Elliot Winslow and I believe Elliot said they've played 30 times. 20 times. Okay. But that's because I played him in the week. Even younger. I won the first board game. So rather than play against him, but it was real good then. Well, this is a battle. Well, <laughs> okay. It's an end game, even pawns. Yes, you and Magnus would not call it an end game. Okay, but anyway, the queens are off. Uh, takes, and comes the great move. Sacrifice the exchange, which, anyway, pin and lose that pawn. But um, takes, and if king takes the bishop on g5, there will be a knight fork on f7. So, but Josiah looks like, oh, he just gets out of it. He just takes the knight and he is up a pawn. Except now there's two threats. The bishop on f3 and the, uh, the skewer. So, Mr. Winslow has won the exchange, however, the White King is more active, and he's got one pawn. King comes in. So what, what should we do? No, no resigning. I'm sorry, Craig. Not allowed. Not allowed. Josiah's got too many points already. We need, we need someone to take him down to give everybody else a chance. So. A uh, black to move. Win, draw. Could be, could be. H5, I'd probably move the bishop down to C8. Um, but H5, very possible.
Courage is just start eating corn. OK, thank you. Some, courage, courage. Sometimes just you know, take the material. And the only thing you're really afraid of is this e pawn. If you take the b pawn, one thing that means is you have a majority on the queen side. You have that winning advantage you can deal with. So if the pawn comes to e6, this next move shouldn't be so hard. What's that? OK, that's um, maybe. OK, that's, that's maybe, but uh, let's be safe. Well, um, you know, uh, maybe that's, uh, w that could have helped. The, um, the thing is, it, this pawn isn't that dangerous with this rook and the king there. And I guess that's the one thing. Right, right here you say, oh, OK, like we could do this. And, um, yeah, but if you put the bishop on g7 first, when the rook was off gathering pawns, you could push by and have protection for the king and advance the pawn. Actually, even now, um, okay. yeah, OK, this, this yeah, is. Well, which move? B5. B5, and you'd go B4 and bishop. Uh, yeah, further, yeah such as takes, ta um, takes bishop d7, threatening king e8, and. Well, well rook, rook to e2, he's still. Ah, okay. And you. St ooh, you don't really stop it. You lose your rook. And actually, I thought king g7 was so clever and important, but actually rook f2 right away. Well, uh, okay. I mean, you could you could um, take the uh, a pawn and uh, yeah, and then just get your your rook after. Right? You, and you, yeah. Play bishop against two passes. Uh, with a double special class. Yeah, this probably White's going to be able to draw the game here. March up with the king so that the, uh, yes, it's, black has the winning chances here. Yeah. Um, if we were more precise back here, um, uh, king there. Oh, maybe we should go king f6 immediately. Or rook. Perhaps this way would, um, you're threatening king to f6. Oh, no. He has king there. Now king f7 allows bishop to h5. Um, OK. Well, king f6, there's king to f8. Yeah, so we, it's, I suppose the, com the computer is very convinced, but uh, I guess I can understand why Elliot was leery of this position. Um, I suppose. Check and then here e6 takes and oh sorry let's give the check yes thank you check well, 
Well, king, king to d8 uh, will go rook to uh, e3 immediately because bishop e6 oh. isn't good. In any case, we get to sacrifice the um, right. rook and uh, bury it. One thing for sure is to be hard to win for. Yeah. yeah. That's the middle three pawns, and then somehow win the ship and run with pawn. Well, yeah, so this, this would, and with the king all the way on the back rank, those pawns become extremely dangerous. But, um, but you go way back to where the pawn push to e6. Uh, uh, this position? Oh, did white play e6 there? Uh, yes. Okay, say we uh, again, you know, now we have going to have rookie two, so takes, <coughs> not sure which move, but if we get rookie, push the, pawn. push the pawn, but if we get king to f6 now, and we just stop your pawn because. Okay, rook takes e6. Yeah, but it's it, very difficult. It was a very uh, threatening pawn. But it was for me. Let, let's see some of the real action, though. We had, um, okay. Yeah, let, let us, let's. <laughs> Excuse me, Mike. Um, it's all right. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, Mike oh, Bear. No, Mike. Mike Bear. That's absolutely fine. Well. This is, this is a brilliancy, folks. You see, you see heavy opening preparation here. The Latvian gambit, played by my favorite player of all time, Jochino Greco. That's, um, it's a fighting opening. It takes no prisoners, unbalances the game right away. And Who knew that a guy, named, a guy from Italy named Greco was actually Latvian? <laughs> Now, the Latvians started playing it 300 years after Greco. And, but now Jerry has taken up the mantle with his own. <laughs> well, you can decide. I mean, or you could simply ask Jerry here. But Jerry has his own line. Everybody plays queen to f6, and that's in all the books. No, no, Just, okay, maybe knight c6. But Jerry goes queen e7, and that's, uh, if you're just meeting this over the board, what, what a thing, because he's just inviting you to check with the queen. It's a, that's pretty much the whole point of the Latvian, is to give up that rook in the corner for one speculation. Yes, you're begging your opponent to come in, attack you, take your material. That's, uh, you know, you have to... That's, it's true, but it's, it's not easy over the board, is it? <laughs> it's, I'm just smiling. Well, well Mike, Mike is a principled man, and he, he checks. And pawn to g6, and he takes that pawn. You know, the h pawn is pinned because of the rook. And the game is over. No, it's not over because the great one is playing the black side, and he is not afraid. Check. And, okay. And, and you have a choice. You can move the bishop on e2 and that g pawn is happening, or the king to d1 over the board. With the knight, yes. You, in fact, you would. Um, he'd, he'd end up doing knight f6 and and taking the knight. We um, we will go back to bishop e2. You know, when I when I look at this without calculating, my first instinct is to play king to d1. That might play. Just okay. You've got all the um, white pieces around your king. You're going to win material. <laughs> you have been warned. 
<laughs> oh no, I think he's gonna he's gonna play this. But see what he does. Knight f6. So you can discover with that knight, but we'll take your queen. So you you can you can go you can go queen to h4 when we could trade the queens about even, or you could go uh, queen to h3. Just keeping that. Um, a nice space square. What could possibly happen? Queen g4. Is that what Terry played? Yes. Suddenly, look at all this. I mean, just leave leave the rook, leave the problems. But knight g4 isn't just a triple fork, it's checkmate. It isn't just a triple fork, <laughs> So... Well, so Mike, Mike defends against it. It's, it's uh, been unfortunate already here. And then Jerry now takes the knight on the queen. And and this is trouble. That there's really nothing else to do, but you know, Mike tries his, his way, counterattack on the queen. And um, yeah, it's, there, there was no way out, and, and Jerry does check discovered attack on the queen. Very much in the style of Greco. You know, you, you must have some Italian heritage there. It's, <laughs> So we, we could go back to the um, making our own theory here, if anyone's doing it. Mike suggests bishop to e2, and black may attack the queen, sacrifice the exchange, and take the pawn on g2. Um, then save the rook, king to f7. So theoretically, white's better, but this is a very complicated position. Black has the center, some uh, extra development, and I'm, I'm sure Jerry's going to have more games in this. Yes, we have to give you a hand for that one. Nesmedimov? Nesmedimov, yes. So, so Jerry's like Nesmedimov. So he maybe he loses, you know, plays the, the Latvian and loses seven games to come into. But then this game happens, and it's uh -huh. all justified. That's, that's, that's the, the addictive property of the last yeah. game. That's the game to if, if any of you, uh, there, there's actually, the, there's a guy who does a, a weekly podcast of chess players yeah, interested yeah. in John Donaldson. Yeah. Again, he was, he was at, John was actually the first one. And he just interviewed him again, you know, how's the retirement going, you know, busy. And among other things, he mentioned one of the people that, are, that have inspired him. And he said there are two octogenarians that are playing, that are still playing and, and winning, and uh, um, that are impressive. And one of them is Anthony Sadie, who just beat some 2,500 GM. And the other one is a guy named Victor's Pupils, who probably has you actually last year. Yeah, he's Mr. Yes, well, he's lived, he's lived forever in Washington. He beat Pitcher in the World Junior Open. Oh, a while ago, but he still plays, and, it, and he often shows up in Concord, and if you, if you meet him, if you see him there, ask him to tell you about his greatest Latvian Gambit game. He has a Latvian game, you have to play it, and it's had an incredible game. I knew it's not so theoretical anymore, but it's an amazing, incredible game. Okay. What's the name of the blogger? The blogger is uh, Ben Johnson. Perpetual Jazz or Perpetual Jazz Yes. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to get on to yes, some of sorry. these games that are uh, very good. This. Um, <laughs> But anyway, yes, in your 80s, no reason to stop playing competitive chess. Or the Latvians, for that matter. 
Okay, this was a game full of fight. Uh, Glenn Kaplan and, and uh, Glenn Mazur. Uh, sorry, Tom Mazur. Sorry. I, um, starts out just kind of a uh, English Catalan, but uh, he, White allows pawn to d4, which is a bit disruptive, you know, taking some space. And then knight a6, very provocative move. So Glenn checks. And on pawn to c6, the natural way of stopping it, he says, kaboom, just check. And uh, you've won a pawn, and it's check. And Tom doesn't back down, takes the bishop, and check, you're going to lose either the knight on a6 you know, or the rook on a8, whatever interposes. But Tom's unfazed. Queen d7, take the rook on uh, a8, and starts with a threat. White, white you'll see, is not developed. And the board's very open, so this is a dangerous way. But OK, uh, kudos to Glenn for uh, playing very aggressively, going after the material. He's got some problems, though. The first one on uh, C2. And he stops that. Tom goes pawn to D3. Kind of a troublemaking move there. So. Probably he should try something else. He goes, but pawn to e3 keeps everything solid on the, um, the white side. And I, I tell you people to uh, look at Morphy's games because still it's, it's very relevant and very principled. And this move is sort of like Morphy. You develop. Threatening castle. Threatening <coughs> just to get all your pieces in play. And uh, once you castle, you'll be threatening bishop to b7. So um, Glenn says, OK, get my queen out of dodge. It gets attacked, pawn to f3, and again, Tom castles. So if we add up the material, uh, black is down the exchange and two pawns. But I think most of you would rather have the black side here just because they're all out, they're all doing something. Yes, this is, this is fun for the black side. Initially, it was very fun for white, but uh, now black gets the fun. So it plays well. You have to develop. Knight g4 is a nice move um, because of the pin pawn. And he castles. Knight to e5, wonderful active square. And knight g5 is very good. So you can't really do anything yet for the, the black side. You can't crash through. And this is a kind of move that really helps your attack. You just prevent white from doing what he wants. He wants to put a knight on e4, just solidify that side of the board, and you, and you stop it. Um, yes, and it's, it's looking rather difficult again. These just aren't developed. They're not in the game. So try to find a safe spot. Rook f6. Pawn to e4. Just trying to break through. And uh, then Tom hits the knight on g5. The one piece that's active doing anything. Now it has to run back. And then, um, oh, Pawn takes e4, knight takes f3. That's, there will be a breakthrough for, uh, for black. So uh, Glenn decides. Can white go f4? Can, uh, white go f4? Um, uh, well, yes, yeah, you, you, could, you could win the queen with the bishop takes e4, although you lose quite a bit of material. Yeah, that's, that's probably winning because. So again, the white pieces are so undeveloped. You, you, could, you could probably even do better than that and um, 
move the knight to g4 first. Get this long diagonal is, is a problem. Um, yes, I don't know. We can go knight f7 or knight g6. That knight's lost the pawn on e4. I'm afraid it's, it's really difficult for the... Um, yeah, if you, you, I think you can win the queen without losing the rook and bishop. Just, um, um, just move the knight. We like your game. So it's, it's really hard to give good advice to White in this position. And uh, Glenn played h4. Um, so now the material's roughly even in points, but the black attack is coming. Um, <coughs> rook takes g5, queen to h4, and a nice finish here. Um, pawn takes e4 because the rook is immune. There'll be a, a checkmate. Yes. Yes, they never got out of the game, never got out of bed. So nothing really to be done here. Pawn to g4. Knight f3 is a nice move. Rook takes, takes. You can take the rook again, but discover check with the pawn and uh, make a queen. So Len tried being there, but then uh, nothing left to do. So very nice game by Tom. Yes. All right, we're, maybe we, uh, this is our new system and hopefully we can go faster through some games. Uh, Alan Chen and Tony Cole will get to the action part. White to move here, and unfortunately, you can see the moves. I'll have to make those smaller. But yes, it's like okay. There we are. So um, white to move. Looks like there's a lot of action here in the center. Yes, yes. It's funny. Pawn to a6. And it's, if you take the knight on e5, I would take the bishop on b7, and I'm going to win a piece because I'm threatening the rook. So have to retreat with the bishop. In which case, yes, the knights just come in, and they are, um, yes. And it's a funny thing, the knights jumping in there, trapping that rook down there. Yeah, sorry, an, ex an exchange. You do lose the knight, but a winning position for the white side. Right. And in a situation like that, is it better to go after that rook, which isn't really in the game yet, or to take a more advanced knight on d6 because you still get a piece, right? And then uh, your minor piece is still active in the game, whereas the guy's rook is. Yes, yeah, so you could have taken the knight on d6 also. That's maybe yes, maybe even a better move, but I, yeah. I do like the the look of those knights down there, <laughs> just trapping everything. Especially right next to the other two. Yes, <laughs> very, very picturesque. <laughs> you might be able to do that. Um, do, do we have time for one more? Well. Uh, Mike, uh, okay, this, this, a uh, London system. We get a very interesting game, uh, kind of. That was, my, I think that was inconsistent. I kept on looking at this going, I'm going to be a tempo up in the, in the uh, 
Karash type position, which which is true, except for I play a system which it attacks the king if it's on a king side or or f two or g three, and makes no sense in this position. So three b six is probably not correct. No, the opening isn't really great for you. It it's white has this um wedge in the center that's pretty solid. So probably a little edge here. And uh, yes, he kind of easily gets the pieces out. But, um, but this move, this was your mistake of the game. But I, I admire that um, you know, you're, you're really going after him, break I, down that center. I, I got the better of, of Peters in this position, except for his king it was on f2. And it made more sense then. <laughs> If the white king were on f2, yes, you would be breaking down that diagonal, yeah. queen to b6. So, anyway. But here, it's, um, it, it, yeah, it, it's not good. bishop e3 and takes, which, OK, you win this cent. Well, you, yeah, you can't really win, take on d4 because of the old um, takes on uh, h7. So, but you. Um, you did a very principled French move, uh, breaking open the center. And yeah, that looks like the black <coughs> pieces are jumping out here. Uh, the, the one little flaw that um, the poor king is very lonely over here. And that's uh, so Tenzing did, uh, went right after him. And the white pieces just get there faster. And. OK, king e6, good defensive move. But this is actually not greedy, but a very nice attacking move that that bishop can check. So no, no way to defend this. OK, and I can't. But yeah. Yes, and then if king to c7, knight. But I have to say, though, and looking at all the games, you know, they're in the World Cup. They're playing good chess, but they just don't have as much action or combinations as you guys have. So, good, good luck tonight. Just put this somewhere safe. 